Well, then we have Pierre, which is in the room here, and he's going to talk about, I think it's Nixt. I hope I pronounced Pierre and Nixt right. He corrects me if I did wrong. Uh, <laughs> yes. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, my, my mic is not so good, so sorry about the noise. Hope it'll be fine. Um, it's fine. We can hear just fine. Okay, okay, good. So, hey guys, uh, yeah, I'm Pierre Neithart from uh, Atlas Engineer, and uh, today I will present the Nix browser. It's a web browser that's a bit different. Nix browser, uh, yes, so like many open source projects, it came out of a out of the frustration with the current browsers. Uh, on the one hand, we have the popular browsers like Chrome or Firefox, and uh, I don't find them very interesting. I think uh, like if you're a programmer, if you're a tech user, you like to customize your things. Uh, you like to add uh, key bindings to this feature or that feature. And it's the kind of things that you typically cannot do very well with uh, a program like Chrome. Uh, yes, you have some extensions, but you're a bit limited. And the user interface is uh, yeah, very inflexible. So uh, on the other hand, we also have a bunch of uh, uh, geeky browsers like for the tech users like it's a there's a legion of them really literally uh, and many of them are very interesting but uh, I found that in practice they don't really stand the, the test of time um, like um, maybe you've heard of the browser called Conqueror which uh, got deprecated when Firefox moved away from Zol XUL the, the former extension language and this happens a lot because uh, typically these browsers are uh, closely tied to the renderer and that makes them very dependable. So we tried uh, to make a browser that would not suffer from this issue by making it a bit more uh, universal. And uh, another aspect is uh, extensibility. So many of these browsers, the, the, the geek, geeky browsers, they focus on um, on uh, like some sort of extensibility, but I always find it a bit too limited to my taste. I mean, I really like to to push it, the concept of extensibility to a whole new level. And uh, well, th this is what we try to do. And um, so today I, I will demo uh, some of these uh, uh, extensibility features. Um, and we, yeah, because the next browser really prides itself at, at creating something a bit new here, something more extensible that, uh, than, than most programs. Um, a little bit like the Emacs of the web browsers, if you if you heard of the infinitely extensible uh, Emacs text editor. Um, so for, for, for this, uh, we've used a programming language called Lisp, uh, very much like Emacs. Um, the benefit of uh, this programming language is that it's, uh, it allows for extremely good uh, live and interactive programming. And I will uh, demo some of this today. So um, let's get started. So I've recorded a quick video because uh, I thought it would make the demo a bit uh, smoother. So uh, let me play it. OK. So this is um, the entry point. So uh, we we see the main page here. Uh, and at the bottom, uh, I run. So this is the entry point to the entire UX of the interface. It's essentially the power bar, we, we call it a prompt. And uh, here it is a prompt that lists all the commands that are available. Now, what's interesting is that this prompt allows you for uh, fuzzy searching. So uh, in this case, you see a bunch of commands that are suggested here. And if I start typing like URL set, it will match the set URL command, regardless of the, the word order, right? It's a bit smart about it. You can even complete against uh, the the bindings or the doc string that appears to write. So that's the documentation, right? So if I type complete, then it will automatically uh, narrow down to the only suggestion and so on. So let me create a new buffer. Uh, yeah, so what the first thing, uh, what do we call a buffer here? It's essentially uh, what we call a tad in other other browsers. Um, the reason we, don't, we do not call them tabs is because uh, we don't display them as tabs because we find this uh, UX element a bit useless when you have too many tabs. I mean, that's like the most typical problem with, uh, with Chrome or Firefox, that when you get a crazy list of tabs, I mean, you get lost in them. And uh, sometimes you can search them. Uh, it's not super convenient. But then it's always a bit limiting. Uh, and I will show 
more uh, more a bit later. So here we I uh, query uh, Wiki Tomato to open a page on Wikipedia about tomatoes, right? So I can try to do this another time with uh, the list programming language, and we will open another tab or buffer about the list programming language. So now uh, I bring up a buffer of the, sorry, uh, a prompt that lists all the buffers or tabs that I have opened, and it's three of them: the, the starting page and the two Wikipedia pages. Um, and what's interesting here is that uh, I can firstly search the the tabs by their URL or by their title. Uh, and after doing so, I can even, um, wait, let me, uh, yes, uh, so also notice that how the, the, the display of the prompt is structured, right? So we we can display anything and uh, with the properties like the title, the ID, and so on. We'll come back to this later. Um, and okay, so now I can uh, here I can narrow down to all the wiki pages and decide to select them all, and uh, which automatically uh, automatically uh, discards the non-matching pages, and then I can decide to run any action on top of it. So here I have a bunch of action in a recursive prompter, and I can actually create new actions. So anything I want, for instance, bookmark this buffer or uh, purses them to disk, anything like this. Um, so in that sense, it's much more powerful than uh, the kind of uh, tab search you can do in, uh, in Firefox or Chrome, because, uh, well, you don't just search the buffer, you can actually act upon it. So you, for instance, you can delete all the Wikipedia buffers uh, in that sense. Uh, but let's not do this right now. So. Um, um, uh, let's get back to our uh, uh, Wikipedia page, and uh, okay, let us consider this other uh, another uh, example that I, I find pretty cool. But next, that I don't find in many other browsers, is that uh, you see the table of content here. Uh, it's on Wikipedia, but you see it in most pages. There's always um, uh, HTML headers like H1, H2, H3, etc. And it would be nice to navigate them because they give structure to your page and. Usually, it's kind of a good, uh, good uh, mnemonic to to know where you are on the page. So here uh, we implemented uh, a, a prompter called Jump to Heading, which automatically lists all the prompt, uh, sorry, all the headings. And as usual, uh, with uh, as with any prompt, uh, you can actually firstly search the heading. For instance, here we go to the major dialect, and it will automatically get us on the page, uh, like scroll down to the to the appropriate section. And as we navigate the, the header, then it gives, gets us to the section. So this is a very general concept. Uh, so, and now let me come back to this uh, presentation in the prompter uh, where we display URL, title, ID, etc. So we can display, because it's programmable, you can also display whatever you want about these suggestions that we're displaying. So here we have URL and title, which makes a lot of sense for a, a tab, but there's also the ID, and so keywords, now, let's say I'm not interested in displaying the idea. Well, I can actually unselect idea, like here, and now it's gone. So it actually displays, it updates the prompt live. Uh, you can add uh, more elements, you can remove them, etc. cetera. Um, OK, so uh, another, uh, OK, let, let, let me go to the our front page. Uh, Next, as an engineer, visit the page is quite interesting, has some cool examples and articles. Now, another feature that's very popular in uh, many of the gig browsers, there's also a bunch of uh, extensions for Firefox, I think um, it's been parallel on these kind of things, uh, is the ability to navigate links with the keyboard. And these are typically called uh, hints or link hints. Uh, basically, you press a key and it displays this, uh, this bunch of tags on top of the, all the links you can follow. And then if you press uh, AA, it will automatically follow the link uh, that corresponds to the hint. Now, um, in most browsers, it's a bit, uh, what's a bit inconvenient is that you've got to read the, the link hint, for instance, AA, AB, AC, et cetera. But what if uh, you know you want to click on download and uh, but you don't know that it's going to be an in advance. Uh, so if you type, um, uh, let, 
let me wait for the demo. Okay, so if you type AN, it will automatically uh, narrow down to the download. We can also type down and it will narrow down to the download page as well. So you can actually first search not only by hint, uh, by, the, by the letters, but also by URL or even by the, by the text of the corresponding to the URL and so on. So that gives, like that uh, basically pays way for a very powerful type of uh, keyboard manipulation of your web content. Um, okay, so let's uh, move on to a different topic, um, that of uh, history. So in, um, in most browsers, the history is uh, something linear. So you have uh, forward, the forward button, the backward button. Um, and the, the thing is that it doesn't really represent what you navigated. So let me give you an example. I go to the program, programming languages uh, page in Wikipedia. Then I go back, I uh, click on another link, like uh, Alonzo, Alonzo, Alonzo Church, sorry. Uh, then another link, Lambda Calculus. Okay, all the geeky mathematical things. Okay, now I go back twice to my original starting page. Now, if you've been following what I've been doing, uh, at this point, uh, you'll notice that I've been branching. So the history is not branching. It means that uh, we have two, technically two forward children in history. The first page we visited, which is programming languages, and the second, which is uh, that of Alonzo Church. But in a regular browser, um, if you click forward, it will only bring you back to the last page you visited, which is Alonzo Church. So the forward history of the contained programming language is gone. So if you lost information there, I think that's a pity. I mean, in general, like, you, if you stick to the same tab and you navigate uh, for many, many URLs, uh, well, chances are that uh, you will erase much of the history that you've navigated. So in, in Next, we don't do this. Instead, uh, we store the history uh, as a tree, which means that we always keep information of everything we've ever visited. Uh, so let me display this uh, concretely, uh, actually, uh, in form of a tree. So we have a command for this, which is called uh, buffer history tree. And there. So it's exactly... Um, it exactly represents the navigation, right? So the first link is the, the one we started from, the Wikipedia page of that list. Then we navigated to programming language, went back, and then navigated to Alonzo Church, finally to the sub page from their Lambda Calculus. And then we went two parents up back to this pro, uh, programming language, which is in italic here, so it's a current page. Now all these links are clickable, so it allows me to navigate back to history uh, where I was. So I hope this is clear. Maybe it's a bit confusing at first, but uh, it's a very powerful thing. And all this, all this history uh, navigation of things are available as comments as well. History forwards, history forwards, uh, backwards, and all the entries also fuzzy searchable. Cool, right? So yeah, uh, that gives you a lot of power. I mean, you don't need to click, 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 and so on until you're finding the right page. Now, uh, we talked about history. Let's talk about bookmarks. So. Let's bookmark the current URL. So what is a bookmark? A bookmark is basically a URL, usually associated with the title, uh, but we can add extra data. And uh, in Next, we made sure to add as much data as we could. So one thing we do is that we have a text uh, analytical engine, which essentially parses the page and tries to collect the most meaningful keywords. So here it appropriately got at least two good keywords here, Lisp and language. So I will select these two, and it will add them to the bookmarks. Uh, and this, these will be used as tags. So if, if you can do this in Firefox as well. I mean, bookmarks can have tags, and then you can filter all your bookmarks by, by tags. So it, it makes for convenient and composable grouping. Uh, now, let me show where these uh, bookmarks are stored. So they are stored in a file, and I can actually access this file directly from uh, Next. I can call the command edit user file. Uh, which lists all the files that are, that are editable from Next uh, there. So that's my bookmark file. And it opens it in Emacs, uh, my favorite editor. Well, it opens it in any editor, right? So that's the list of my three bookmarks. Um, so one line per bookmark, you see here, there are the tags that I've selected. Uh, there's the date, the title, and the URL. And what's convenient is that there is one bookmark per line. It's uh, it, stored in a human readable fashion as well. So you can edit it by hand. 
And it also means that you can keep it under version control, like uh, with Git. And you, you know, you can store your bookmarks on GitHub, maybe or whatever. And uh, it, it's uh, it's friendly for the version control because I can show the diff uh, and the history in a meaningful fashion. Okay, so much for bookmarks. Uh, now let's talk about something else, uh, something that's very uh, dear to the heart of uh, all the geeks out there: the key bindings. Uh, Geeks really like to have to customize the key bindings to to their favorite flavor, like uh, VI bindings or maybe uh, um, uh, Emacs bindings. So here I will uh, enable uh, some. Uh, so the, the thing with uh, yeah, the thing with Next is that it comes with uh, three different flavors out of the box. The CUA flavor, which is uh, Control C, Control V, etc. The, the regular, uh, more familiar. Kind of key bindings. Um, it also comes with Emacs, the Emacs flavor, and the VI flavor for uh, Vim users. So here I will enable uh, a mode, Emacs, which enables the Emacs key bindings. So now you see that, oh, sorry, to the bottom right of the screen, our uh, Emacs is displayed, which means that the Emacs mode is activated. Now I can press Control N and Control P, which is like the regular bindings for Emacs to scroll up and down. Here I've enabled the VI normal. Uh, bindings, so I can press G and K, and if I click on a text box, uh, you notice that the, the N has switched to I for insert mode, so if you're familiar with them, you know what it means. It means that now I can press G and K, J and K, and will appropriately insert the characters instead of scrolling up and down. If I press escape, I go back to normal mode, and I can disable the mode and go back to the CUA bindings. So. What's uh, remarkable about this is that uh, so modes uh, in, in Next are very much like extensions in, in Firefox or Chrome, uh, but the main difference is that they are not global. They actually work uh, per tab. And that's very interesting because it means that you can enable Emacs bindings in one tab and uh, CUA bindings in another tab. Uh, but let me, let me give you a better example for uh, a good use case of this, of this, uh, you know, like, like it's more general than global globality. It's actually locality gives you more general uh, control over what you can do with your browser. So let let me go to uh, the Tor browser page. Which uh, so if you download Tor, it's essentially uh, an enemy uh, uh, privacy uh, privacy enforcing um, uh, how do you say. Um, well, I mean, it works as a proxy here on my computer. I've installed a proxy, and it will detect this web page will detect if I'm going to Tor or not. So uh, here it tells me that I'm not using Tor because I'm using the default settings. However, if I enable the proxy mode, which is configured to use the, prox the Tor proxy, then um, so I enable the mode, press Enter, it displays to the bottom right. Now I can reload the page, and the web page tells me I'm uh, it's configured to use Tor. But what's interesting is that if I go to this uh, other page, well, or uh, this uh, the tomato page on Wikipedia, new page, it won't be using a proxy, so it will still be using the regular connection. Uh, so that, this allows me to separate tabs using a proxy from tabs not using a proxy. This is super convenient, and for some reason, uh, it's kind of hard to do in, uh, in other browsers. Uh, same like here, I can disable JavaScript. So if I reload the page, you will see that the link here uh, disappears. JavaScript is now disabled, but it's still uh, enabled on the Wikipedia. So if I try to search here, you will see that the JavaScript is still working. Uh, okay, so that's uh, yeah. I've been demoing so far a lot of features. Now, what about the programmability aspect of Next? So, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, it's written in Lisp, and we have an integrated Lisp repo. So a REPL is essentially a common prompt, like, like, like you have for, for Python, for uh, Ruby, any programming language that's a bit interactive will usually do a feature a REPL. Uh, so this is a regular, uh, so this REPL, so we can, we can write any code. So here, a simple addition. All right, so far, so good. Now, let's say that I write a typo. So I want to compute an exponential, but uh, yeah, I wrote, I wrote it wrong. So if I press Enter here, it will, oh. Okay, so you will tell me that there's an error and display the debugger, and I can actually interact with it. 
from the browser itself. Now, I can compute the exponential properly, and you see that it handles big numbers perfectly well. That's regular Lisp. Now, what if we do something that's a bit more related to Nix itself, to the browser? So the current buffer function returns, well, the, the current buffer or tab object, if you will. And notice that it's a link, so I can actually click on it. What happens? Let's see. All right, so it brings me to a new page, which, which is essentially an inspector of the object. And it lists all the different uh, attributes of this object, which are modifiable with a change button. But I can also see how it also displays some other links. And that actually, that's because the, the inspector is recursive. So I can click on one of these links. Let's see, um, maybe, yeah, maybe this one. Um, Yes, uh, okay, sorry. Uh, let's click on the URL. Okay, now I inspect the URL, and uh, well, uh, I have all the URL attributes there displayed as well. So uh, yeah, it makes for a very powerful introspection of all the core of Nix. So not just the extension, not just the surface, but really everything is accessible from there. But not just from within, uh, within Nix, we also uh, enable remote programming, so you can use your favorite editor, the favorite IDE to program next while it's running. And this is key. I mean, we're talking about live programming of the browser. So uh, here I can run the command start slink or swank, which is basically a language server. So if I execute it, then uh, I can switch to my REPL. So this is Emacs uh, running Sly. Well, it's uh, environment development for Lisp. It's a pretty good one. You can choose the one you like. And from here, well, I can basically do the exact same thing. I can like, call the, the command current buffer. Uh, and from there, it gets me also an introspectable item. And I have a different interface to introspect and uh, program everything. So I, I won't go uh, more into details, because then it becomes like some hardcore list programming. But uh, from there, you can create commands, bindings, shortcuts, pretty much everything. So that's it for the demo. I hope you liked it. Thank you for watching. And uh, well, I'll stick around for some questions. Allow me to unshare. Oops. Very nice. I, I have some questions. I don't know. Uh, the audience still haven't sent some, but I have some. <laughs> um, yes. Well. The first, I have one about plugins. How is the plugin ecosystem? For example, I depend a lot on the, on some plugins on Chrome. Yes, so th that's a popular question, and that's a tough one. <laughs> so, um, so there are we. So there are basically two categories of plugins. You could say one is the a Lisp extension. So we, because uh, I mean, out of the box, basically the programming language gives us support for. Uh, Lisp extensions out of the box. So anyone can write their own extension using Lisp. And just like in Emacs, uh, you would write an extension as well. And uh, you, know, you can manipulate the whole browser. And these extensions are very powerful because they have access to the whole thing. So if we didn't expose something in our API, it's fine. The extension can still access the internals if they want to. There are some protocol for this. Uh, it's not like something insecure or anything. It's fine. But um, now, what about existing Chrome extensions? So uh, these extensions, I mean, Chrome or Firefox, uh, they are usually similar. So these extensions, they uh, they follow a product, uh, product, uh, standard sorry, called uh, web extension. That's the name of the standards, uh, like uh, ad block and these kind of things. Uh, and to support the standards, it's actually really tricky. Uh, we've been working on it for uh, you know, about a year. We've put it on hold. Uh, we've got some demo working. So we've made some great progress. and. Basically, the, the base of the protocol is working, but we don't have, uh, we're not done yet. So something like uBlock uh, doesn't work yet. Uh, we would really like to, to find the time to finish it because uh, it's, a, it's a feature that, that's been, uh, that's extremely. Uh, this feature would asked. make Chrome plugins and Firefox plugins compatible with it? That's exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it means that for the better part of it, uh, yeah, plugins would be compatible. Yeah. Nice. And yeah. So, so, like, as a, I imagine you do developing or, or some kind of, kind of browse developing. Uh, do you use any tool that, that you think like, oh, this tool doesn't have in Chrome and it's, and it's so handy here to, to code? Like, what, what would you recommend for, for coders to try out? 
for sorry uh, i'm not sure i got a question what do you mean for coding yeah i was asking if you have a, yeah like useful for example th there's a developer extensions at chrome you, you showed some for example the, the introspection element and things like that is there any other thing you would recommend developers to explore at mix uh in next yeah yeah um so that's uh yeah that's an area we've been exploring as well so uh we have a dom a dom do document object model um api so we can actually okay so this is a little bit of a tricky question because it's quite technical but essentially uh we can we have apis to manipulate the dom and then to manipulate a javascript as well in ways that are not so easy to do with other browsers so in that sense, uh, Nix can give you some very powerful tools here. Uh, very like different doing apps with different proxies, for example. That, that's something I wouldn't be able to do at Chrome easily. So, uh, that kind of thing, that's for sure. But that's more like on the UX side. But if you are talking okay. about like web programming, uh, we can also do things like uh, like manipulate the DOM using the, 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 the power of Lisp in, in a way. And that means that uh, you, you get very powerful tools. Like you get, you get macros, you get introspection, you get these kind of things. Yes. Uh, that's really cool and it, it's also live and being live that means that you don't have to restart your website you can program everything within the browser uh you know you're just refreshing your works that is pretty cool um cool. but there's more that we'd like to explore like uh your uh, maybe you're familiar with a tool called selenium which which allows for uh yeah like, I uh, yeah so to essentially uh tinker with uh, the the web the content of the website so there is a lot of room for improvement uh, for Next in that area. So we've started doing some things there, uh, but yeah, we eventually we'd like to reach a bit closer to Selenium. That would be nice. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Pierre. It was great to see. Uh, I, I even joked, it's, it's kind of like Ving as a browser, and I love Ving, so it's it's very, it's very cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's very close to this kind of programs, you know, uh, for for tech users. Like you can you can really hack it, you know, you can uh, fiddle with it. Uh, adapted to your needs, these kind of things. Well, thank you then. You're welcome. Thanks.